Hello everyone, thanks for coming out. My name is Rob Spillman. I'm the chairman of the curatorial committee and on behalf of the 5,000 members of Penn, I want to welcome you here and thank you to all of the uh, volunteers and organizers who have put this together and thank you to all of our sponsors who and uh, co-presenters who have made this possible, including the New York Women's Foundation which has been very helpful in putting together these last two panels. And I'm going to turn it over to Anna Oliveira from the New York Women's Foundation, who is going to uh, lead us through. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Good evening. Let, let us begin by um, thanking Pan America for the opportunity to this partnership. And thank you for being here. And I'm going to introduce our panel. I hope that uh, we couldn't have had a more appropriate introductory video to what this panel is about. And um, we are talking about the role of art in social justice. Um, and we are joined by three incredible, uh, I'm going to say art activists, social justice activists, and I'm going to briefly introduce each one of them to you. Sitting next to me is Jessica Greer Morris, a social justice advocate and published playwright. One of Newsweek's 150 fearless women who shake up the world. A recipient of Self Magazine's Women Doing Good Award and an Aspen Institute scholar. Jessica has produced theatrical work for the White House, the United Way Nations, TED Women, and eight Girl Be Heard International Tours. Next to Jessica is Hafiza Gator, poem, whose poems have appeared in the New Yorker, Na Narrative Magazine, Gulf Coast, Boston Review, Los Angeles Review of Books, and Line Break, among many others. Hafiza is born in Zaria, Nigeria, and also serves on the board of Vida, Women in the Literary Arts, and co curates the reading series Empire with Ricardo Maldonado. <coughs> She is the Poetry Committee and Book Ends Committee for the Brooklyn Book Festival and is currently the content editor and publicity coordinator at Poets House. Please welcome Hafisa. And Janina Braski is one of the most revolutionary voices in Latin America today, writes in Spanish, Spanglish, and English. Her work explores the enculturation process of millions of Hispanic immigrants and Latinos to the U.S. and dramatizes the three political options of her native Puerto Rico, nation, colony, or state. Her books include Empire of Dreams, Yo-Yo Boing, and United States of Banana. We are going to begin. The format for the, our conversation will, I've asked each of them to take some time and talk about their work in art and social justice. Then I will, we will have a little bit of a conversation and then open up to you for your questions. So we're going to begin with Hafiza. Hello. Um, so I figured that odds are if you are here, it's because something, probably one of the two questions in the description, you know, stirred something in you, piqued your interest. So. I wanted to speak directly to those questions, you know, from my experience. So, I'm just going to read some prepared marks. <clears throat> Whenever someone asks me what they can do to support the work, stories, and lives of marginalized voices, the first thing I do is ask them what they've tried. The conversation usually dwindles from there. Though, with the 2014 high-profile police killings of Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, and Michael Brown riding the heels of the 2013 acquittal of George Zimmerman, a curious thing began to happen. White people marched. They marched in the middle of streets in cities across the country. They marched side by side with people of color and in unison proclaimed that black lives mattered. And then, most likely, they marched home. They marched to white workspaces, unfazed by the lack of women or people of color in any positions of power. They marched to holidays where they simply shook their heads at their racist and sexist uncles or parents. They marched to voting booths and voted for their money over another's or, for some, their own civil rights. 
As a Nigerian-American female poet with a Muslim family, my life is full of white people of all genders who want to march for and with me. White people who truly and deeply want to fight racism, misogyny, and bigotry, but are uncomfortable doing it in their own homes or workspaces. So when I consider the question of what we can do to bring more marginalized women's voices to the forefront where we can speak for ourselves, I say first, you have to be willing to lose. You cannot decolonize a space from white supremacy or patriarchy without confronting your own complicity and privilege. Can you confront the fact that the racist loved one that you love the hook at holidays is someone else's oppressor? Can you choose a stranger's dignity over that relationship? Can you confront the fact that at your workplace there is a woman of color who makes far less than you for doing the same job? The second thing I tell people who want to do this work is that they need to re-educate themselves in history. To face the fact that the history that happens in American schools is primarily a fiction. The history of America is unclean. It is a history of omissions and oppression. Can an American that is ignorant or resistant to the truth of its own country ever be capable of a true or humanitarian global consciousness? And what of art? Where an accurate history can help us understand a country, I believe art can help us understand its people and the value systems orchestrated by that country's national identity. My father is a visual artist a figure painter and sculptor whose work mainly concerns itself with the African and black body, especially the women who hold these communities together. His artistic statement opens with the sentence, my mother told me sometimes she felt like she didn't have no life. And he has spent the rest of his painting the life his mother slaved through, depicting not just the trials, but the joys and the strengths. My father is an artist who is perpetually trying to explode America's depiction of Africans and blackness. As a writer, and much like my father, I believe artists have a responsibility. <clears throat> Wrongly or rightly, as a culture, we look to the arts, both high and low, to help us frame our boundaries of justice. In this frame, when Muslims are always depicted as the other and saying, Allahu Akbar, which simply translates to God is great, is always a precursor to terror. It is no wonder that Islamophobia infects our minds and our politics. When Africa is perpetually depicted as a foreign object, its people primitive and its culture of no value outside its relationship to whiteness, it is no surprise that we at once fetishize and despise the people at once while pillaging the continent. When women don't get the same opportunities or stages to tell their own stories in literature, art, music, or history, who then can be surprised that we live in a culture that does not believe women when they speak about their lives or bodies? So we return to the question, what can be done to bring more marginalized women's voices to the forefront where they can speak from the, for themselves? Do more than just marching. Invest not just your thought, but your time, and most importantly, invest your money and share and expand your networks, and use your vo votes to diversify your politics. So I want everyone here to take a second and to consider their own points of power and privilege. So I want you to come up with at least one way in which you have privilege or power in society. Everyone has something? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being none and 10 being all, how much of that power or privilege do you think you are willing to not sacrifice but wield in the service of a marginalized woman? Okay, so do you all have the number? Yeah? Okay, hold it. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being none again, 10 being all, how much of that power or privilege have you actually used to help that community? So odds are the number for what you're willing to do is higher than what you've actually done. Your job is to use whatever tools that, you're, that are at your disposal, whether it is your art, 
gender, race, wealth, or citizenship to close that gap. And lastly, for those of us here that would call ourselves writers or artists, we often feel suffering in deep and complex ways, or at least we claim to. And often in history, the arts of the time become proof and testimony to what happened there. The world is not in need of more soldiers. It is in need of more honest accounting and stories not written by the oppressor. Because as every oppressor understands, a war is won by how it is told. And so they go after the art and the language. As we're seeing now, they dismantle fact. Our jobs as writers and artists is to turn the truth into a fortress. Thank you. Um, yeah, pl pleasure to be here. I actually have a PowerPoint because we're called Girl Be Heard, um, so I think it's really disingenuous to me to talk about the movement and those I serve without introducing them to you, so I have a couple of videos and slides to share with you. So the song you're hearing is a rapper from Narsi, and these are some of the young women's stories that are in our program. Um, but like so many women that come to us, they don't usually know how much talent they have. Um, until we put a little miracle girl on it. And all the videos, everything that's done with photography, it's all done by a community artist. Family, sisters, just the energy. The creativity, how you get to send your voice to other people. You feel so valuable as a person. Girl Be Heard is where I go to feel loved and express myself in every way. I got kicked out of college because I couldn't afford it. And in a week, Girl Heard got me back into school. I was in a really bad place. I was thrilled. I could find a place to express myself and have a second home. Girl Be Heard was my backbone. Before there were times where I was just like, insecure about being a girl. But now I'm more confident. I've been kind of lost. I was bullied in, in middle school because I'm telling myself I am beautiful and and I don't care what anyone else says. You know you're not supposed to judge, so you just feel so comfortable sharing with these girls. And it's just so nice to feel that other people are there right with you. Everyone loves you, no matter what, and it's like a family. You join Girl Be Heard, you get 20 new sisters. So many girls let their voices be heard. You're constantly being told that you can change the world. There's more ways to connect with people. There are stories that need to be heard. Girl Be Heard has changed my life. Let a girl be heard. Get girl power and join the movement. See Girl Be Heard in action. Find a show near you and join the movement at girlbeheard.org. Hi, Great. Um, so I want to just invite you that if you want to turn on your phones, you have some amazing sister artists and activists here. And I think what's really important is not just to talk about art and activism, but what are we going to do after this? And I know I invite each one of you to stay in touch with me. I certainly want to take, stay in touch with everyone on the panel. Um, but I want to say, at our shows, even though we're a theater company that does social justice work, we actually really want to continue that conversation. So feel free if you want to use social media. And in terms of what we do, um, I am actually the founder of Girl Be Heard with a colleague of mine, Ashley Marnaccio. And we started out with 12 girls in 2008. Um, and we realized that creating a safe space for young women um, that a lot of things happen behind, besides a show. We started to get um, responses from principals and parents and teachers and said, what are you doing in that room? My girl used to cut herself and now she doesn't do that anymore. And my young woman was, was being bullied in school and suddenly she's walking around with confidence. And so there's a lot of changes that can be made by creating safe spaces to express ourselves. And for us, that's the power of art. It's not just about um, creating art, but it's actually a healing modality, especially if you're a survivor of so many things women are facing, which I'll talk about soon. And in terms of our programs, we have everything from community-based programs, um, we work in 12 Title I schools, we work in detention centers, domestic violence shelters, we have a theater company, so after you're with the program a year, you get paid for every rehearsal and every performance, and we also do a lot of activ um, activism and advocacy work. One, two, three, And this four. is just one, I'll do one other thing. 
I, I've already introduced you to the girls, um, so I don't think I need to do that again. Um, but it's really important for us to, even though I'm a co-founder of the organization, is that the people that we serve need to be upfront, they need to be amplified, they need to be on the stages. Um, so why do we do this work? Um, if you've come to this panel, you probably already know these statistics, that seven out of 10 women and girls have or will experience physical or sexual violence in her lifetime. Um, the reason that Ivancer does V-Day is because it's one billion, if we, if we count the number of people in this world, on this planet, um, per day, that are survivors of violence. Um, on, on the Upper East Side, it might be date rape. Um, in a place like um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, it might be rape as a tool for war, but the seven out of 10 is happening in every single community around the world. And I know this all too well from those we serve, but we've also done global work as well. And in terms of 195 countries, only 17 are led by women, which means that the power and the money is being held in a, in a very small group of people, mostly white men. And in terms of equal pay, I am 49 years old. I remember trying to pass equal pay when I was probably in kindergarten. Um, so we have a long way to go. And in terms of the statistics, um, even though I think it's up to 79 cents per dollar that a woman earns, um, it's much worse if you're a person of color. Um, if you're African American, it's 68 cents per dollar for every dollar a man earns. And if you're Latina, it's 55 cents. So we have a long way to go. Um, and in terms of um, people that hold elect electoral um, con congressional offices, it's, it's way too few. And in terms of Fortune 500, it's only 4.6%. So we have a lot of work to do. And one of the things I want to talk about is that when I first came to Girl Be Heard, um, it obviously wasn't called Girl Be Heard, uh, but when I first started working with these women, I am a survivor of gender-based violence, so that was really my lens. Um, and survivor of a lot of different oppressions. Like, I've been through so much of what our girls have been through. Everything from depression to eating disorder to, you know, suicide ideation. And I, I really do view this as what happens when you're oppressed. Do you take it out on yourself? Do you take it out on other people? And what's a way that you can begin to heal from that? Um, but one really important thing that we've learned from Girl Be Heard is that we have to be committed to all the things that Havisa was talking about. We have to look at who has privilege and who has power. As a white person, I have a lot of privilege and power. And so we've actually you know, transformed our lens a lot, and we're doing an enormous amount of dismantling racism work, because um, we don't believe that we can possibly have success um, as an intersectional um, feminist organization unless we're going to focus and have a dismantling racism lens on everything we do. So this is the matrix of opportunity. Basically, it's about sharing power with everyone we serve. This is why, after a year, you get paid for every rehearsal and performance. That's why we hire people to run the show. 30% of the teaching artists that go out in the schools are alumni of the program. It doesn't matter if you've worked at McDonald's, we are going to give you the professional skills to move up and get higher paying jobs. And we also have, um, similar to our board of directors, we have a steering committee of youth that are telling us how to do a better job and to have impact on policies that we create within the office. So in terms of our listening model, how do you teach a teacher not to have a didactic teaching approach in the classroom? And it took seven years to develop the listening model, but very simply, we start out every program, whether it's 36 weeks or, or four weeks, asking the young people we serve what issues they care about most. And then the entire curriculum is based on those issues. So whether the issues are involved with gender-based violence, um, date rape, or colorism, whatever it is, they drive the entire curriculum for the entire year that we work with them. And in terms of where we work all over the city, but mostly in areas with the greatest health and economic disparities, which is South Bronx, Northern Manhattan, and Central Brooklyn. And in terms of work globally, the State Department started to hear the stories that our young women were going through. And they started to say, this is happening in countries all around the world. Can you, can you bring your stories to other places? And the State Department started to fund our work and pay our girls to be global ambassadors. So for the first time ever, we sometimes will buy a young person a passport take a young person out of their neighborhood and put them on a global stage at the United Nations, or the US mission in Geneva, or an embassy in Port of Spain, Trinidad. So it's been really exciting to truly share power and give power to young people whose stories are influencing policies and policymakers. So Malala, um, perfect example of a girl who's uh, been oppressed and um, has risen above it like a phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, when Malala came to bring her film here, um, she asked us if we could put her anthem to music. And we're like, can we put your anthem to music? We have so many young people that are songwriters. And what I love about this story is I knew there was one young woman who had been bullied so badly and suffering so much that she couldn't stop cutting herself and had been hospitalized for, I think it was seven times when she came to us at age 12. And as soon as she came within Girl Be Heard, she started to write these amazing songs. 
and now has four years clean of cutting, which is very typical of a young person that comes into our program. There's something very healing about, instead of taking your hardship out on yourself and your body through an eating disorder or self-harm, you begin to share it, and you begin to share it through art. So it was really powerful that within two hours, I called this person and I said, here's Malala's anthem, can you put this to music? And she did it in two hours, and she ended up performing it for Malala and her dad. So if we do give power to those that we serve, they can truly kind of lead the movement and stage revolution for change. So in terms of calling all activists and artists, the entry age for a girl be heard is 12 to 21, and our auditions are August and September. So if you have any young people that would like to audition, please send them to us. We'd love to see them. This is actually a copy of, um, it's actually a photograph from our last show called Blurred Lines about rape culture and campus sexual assault. Um, during the first five to six weeks of college is a very vulnerable time for young people. It's not only young women, it's transgender youth as well, um, when that's the highest number that's going to be um, raped during that time. So we did this show so that we can start to educate not only colleges, not only fraternities and sororities, but to start in 11th and 12th grade and talk about consent to prevent rape from happening. And in terms of advocacy, <laughs> this, this picture on the top left is that Planned Parenthood was having um, an event outside and it was snowing. So we are like the post women and men. We do go out in all weather um, to share stories and songs and monologues to help move the needle on policies. This one was done at the UN to raise awareness about global goals. And right here on the bottom left is one of our more, most recent shows called Say Her Name. To, we had met Sandy Bland, who was killed in police custody and became very close to her mother and her sister. And they asked us to do something in honor of Sandy and the other women who died in police custody that month. And so we ended up writing a show and doing it all over New York City, at City Hall, but also this is a photo at the African Burial Ground. Um, so that show is still going on and we're happy to bring it to any community because it's obviously still going on um, in the criminal justice system. And then in terms of, you know, I talked a little bit about eating disorders. Um, there's a $55 billion diet industry telling us we're fat, ugly, and stupid. Um, so this show is to raise awareness about those issues. And 100% of every girl that came into audition had the same monologue, but different words, was that I'm fat, ugly, and stupid. And these were beautiful, beautiful young women. So in terms of our, our war with food, and it's not just happening with women, it's happening with other people as well, we're being taught these things and sold these things to fix us as if there's something wrong with us. We also did a show about gang and gun violence. Um, what was interesting is the tragedy had happened in Newtown, Connecticut, where a white man went into school and shot up that school. So when our young women had met on Sunday, we meet every Sunday, we call it Feminist Church, from, from two to five on Sundays, our constituents were so upset they wanted to write a show in honor of the folks in Newtown. We said, that's, that's great, do the research, that's the first thing we always say if you want to write a show. And the next week they came back, and they realized after doing the research that 80% of them were homicide survivors, which means they had a loved one in New York City who had died um, because of gun violence. So the show took a completely different turn and became about their personal stories and their communities. And what it's like to listen, have to listen to gunshots throughout the day, to have loved ones die at, at, on a regular basis. So it became focused on what was going on here in New York City. And Blurred Lines, I told you, we did a show about rape culture. It was, we always seem to do shows in a good, I shouldn't say good, um, during times where it's greatly needed, and this was in the middle of the pussy-grabbing conversation. Um, so it was misogyny was running for president and won, um, so it was kind of fitting that they did this show. It was the last one they did. And the last thing I want to say is that, you know, we're in the, we're in the habit of creating safe spaces for artists and activists to express themselves, and it's a movement that anyone can join. Um, so if you know anyone that wants to be a feminist in residence, one of our interns, um, or wants to just join the community at all, I'm just going to welcome you to do that. And thank you so much. And now we turn to Janine. Some characters you will never discover unless you create them first. When you meet a dreamer in a party, someone who creates castles in the air and sees how things should be, and insist on a higher standard of expectation rather than on a higher standard of living, you call him a Don Quixote. There are Quixotes in the world today, just as there are Don Juanes and Carmens. Maybe they were always there as part of a social infrastructure, but it took a Cervantes or a Tirso de Molina 
or a merime to give voice to those characters in order for them to be recognized as such. Some characters you will never discover unless you create them first. Likewise, some countries you will never discover unless you create them first. I wrote United States of Banana. Now people tell me, you saw it all. Not that I'm a prophet, but that I discovered the United States was no longer of America, but of Banana. It went from USA to USB. If like a crab, I could walk backwards only to make America great again. As Heraclitus said, no man ever steps into the same river twice, for it's not the same water and he's not the same man. One cannot make America great again because it's not the same country and we're not the same people as we were before. New waters are flowing, new waves of migrations are coming, and one cannot stop the fluidity of things with a big, fat, ugly wall. I cannot become who I was, but I can take a few steps backwards without looking back, only to gain momentum to leap forward into the air and stay there without foundations, building castles in the air to achieve my higher standards of expectations. This is part of my poetics of the athlete of the heart. Artists are mediums of the people. Sometimes they hardly know how to speak. They speak in tongues, they come from trouble zones, from the borders. They speak of migrations of war. They have survived devastations, insolence of office, neglect, abuse of power. And they still have the strength to say the things as they are, with a certain deceptive precision and enigmatic depth an infinite background. They saw, they see. They find their extreme activity in their extreme passivity. Whenever I hear the term art, I get goosebumps. I distrust the term like I distrust everything that wants control. Art is a control freak. Art works for the eyes, and the eyes work for surveillance. Can't take my eyes off of you. <laughs> It's just too good to be true. The eyes that can take, take the eyes off of you cannot love. The moment of love is not the moment of surveillance. Surveillance has no moment of truth. It's suspicious and surreptitious. Surveillance is censorship. Surveillance is injustice. Surveillance is an abuse of power. It works against the fluidity of things. The fluidity of things should never be stopped. If it is stopped for whatever reason, a punishment happens. Look what happened to Tiresias when he stopped the coitus of two serpents with a blow of his staff between them. He was transformed into a woman for seven years. And then after seven years, he saw the same two serpents in the act of coupling, and he struck with his staff again, and he was transformed back into a man. When Zeus and Hera were arguing about who had more pleasure in bed, Hera said, Men have more pleasure. Sue so said, women have more pleasure. They asked Tiresias, because he had lived as both. And Tiresias said, women have more pleasure. And that made Hera so furious, she blinded him. And Sue so said, excessive punishment. Let me grant him the gift of seeing. What one, one God grants you, another God cannot undo. In other words, an injustice cannot be undone. What another God can do is to grant you a blessing to assuage the injustice. It will balance the inequality. It will be called, in my book, Poetic Justice. In all its metamorphosis, Hera, the jealous wife of Zeus, suspects that her husband has transformed Io, a beautiful woman, into a beautiful cow, in order to disguise his infidelities. But no matter the transformation from a man to a woman, Tiresias, or from a woman to a cow, Io, the character will always remain the same. A rose is a rose is a rose, and it will always have its thorns. Hera recognizes Io and sends Argos with a hundred eyes to keep his eyes on her. Zeus then sends Hermes to kill Argos, but to kill him, 
But to kill him, Hermes must seduce him first with the sound of music. Argos feels so good when he hears that music. He feels at ease, cozy. And like a frog, when he's in lukewarm water, drowns. Not when he's in hot water, not when he's in cold water. But in this lukewarm state of cozy woozy, Argos closes all of his eyes and falls asleep. And that's when Hermes kills him and liberates Io from the captivity of surveillance. The liberation of Io is the liberation of the character from the body, the liberation of the being from the form, and the affirmation of life, as Antonin Nartot said, as that fragile, fluctuating center which forms never reach. I read in Time magazine an article about how millennials think about gender and identity today. They say what I have said all along, fuck gender, go pansexual. They also say they don't want to use the pronoun of he or she, but rather the pronoun they as singular. I said, how in tune I am with the times. <laughs> I have been saying, go choral, go Greek chorus, go to the plurality of God life, go to the new, the we, the hours, the day, go multiply the bread and the wine, go trans and pan with gender and genre, transgender and transgenre, pan gender and pan genre. Genders like genres are melting like seasons. Global warming is a global warning. The borders are no longer effective in underlining distinctions between melodrama and drama, between male and female, between poetry and fiction, between prose and poetry, between culture and politics, between entertainment and journalism. The only thing that is distinguishable is surveillance. How thick are the walls between cultures? I need windows to peek through, but I'm not a spy. I live among the fragments, the torsos, the hands, the body parts of every culture. I eat their leftovers, and their bones I suck to the core of my liberty. Thank you. All right. Uh, any reactions that you have to each other's voices? Uh, just to respond quickly to what you were, I think I'm struck most about, I think you said there's no truth in surveillance. I think you said something like that, which is so fascinating because, you know, as especially American society, we trust so much what we hear about the surveillance, surveillance of others, but we don't actively consider the surveillance that we ourselves are put under. Yeah that we do ourselves. Absolutely. Like exactly, we surveil ourselves with social media. Yeah. And giving so much importance to the eyes mm -hmm. and not to the word. And your and eyes lie. And how the sound traspasses barriers and the sound goes over the wall and the sound goes over over everything, over the, over, over the, what was the, the thing, the crystal, the, the other night I was in this panel we were talking about chattering the, the um, what was it? The glass, the glass ceiling. The glass ceiling. <laughs> and, 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 and we don't have to chatter, we just have to trespass it. We, with our noise, with our colors, with our music, we just have to trespass it. The glass ceiling sometimes is beautiful. It's beautiful. If you look at it, at the physicality of it, it's a beautiful thing. But we make it an ugly thing. We say it's ugly. But honestly, the physicality of it is beautiful. So music and, and sound can go over those things. And I think that's important to know. Because sometimes the most fragile things can be the most strong things. Not only David beat Goliath, but other things can happen. Did you want to talk about our surveillance of Fizan? No. Jessica, <laughs> <laughs> just so inspiring to hear both of you, and um, you know the whole Muslim ban and immigration, all the problems we have now, and this kind of ethnocentricity that like we think we're right, and we think everything outside is, is bad or different, and xenophobia. Like it's it's such a myth. 
it's such a myth, and it just, I just kept thinking about the places that we've traveled, and, and literally every single country we go to, it's, it's misogyny, it's just a different form of misogyny. It's oppression, and it's colorism, and it's racism, it's just like happening, it's happening in Trinidad in a school, it's happening in a refugee camp outside of Denmark, it's the same problem. But in, in this country, we talk about it as if we don't have a problem. So it was so powerful to hear you, the surveillance, like, looking within is the answer, right? Yeah. But we're looking, <laughs> we're looking outside as if there's a problem outside. I, something I'm fascinated by um, is, you know, FGM, female gender mutilation, which is talked about a lot, that in, in other countries, you know, this is happening, and it's a cultural issue, and, you know, it is getting better because the next generation is, is being educated, and I think FGM is, is improving. But in our country, guess what the leading surgery is for, for women in cosmetic surgery? It's labiaplasty. Women are seeing these images of pubescent vaginas, no hair, no nothing, tiny little vaginas, and they're cutting their own genitals to, to make them look better, to fit this pornographic world we live in. So I think, you know, in terms of surveillance, it's really looking within for misogyny and racism. And I have to say, I love what you said about privilege. I mean, it's just, it's such an important question to ask. And, you know, I, I, I have to say, at Girl Be Heard, we, we literally stop work every Tuesday from 1 to 2. And we have what we call a dismantling racism meeting. Because if you're focusing on all these problems, it's really under that umbrella of dismantling racism. Like, it fits transgender issues and, and misogyny and everything. Because the biggest human rights abuse in our country is racism. You know, it's the, it's the greatest, so, so again, I could talk forever, I, I, I love what both of you had to say, and I, I, in terms of both the xenophobia and their surveillance, and looking within is the answer. Yes. So you, you each suggested um, very clearly that your words, art, has a powerful role in both shining a light in self-awareness and our own, um, our own beingness, as well as understanding perhaps a different way of looking at the glass ceiling, a different way of looking at what we perceive as limitations or systems of devaluing oppression, etc. Would you say, how do you think we're doing in that, collectively speaking? I mean, is, um, as we go from USA to USB, how is that role of art really taking place in the U.S. at this point? What would you say? That's a potential, a reality of it. What is your sense of how much is that actually, perhaps, where is that in terms of being a dominant perception, use, and prevalence of the influence of art towards social justice, as you described? So you're asking like how are we doing yeah. using art as a tool of social yeah. activism? Oh, I don't know. I mean, there. I feel like it has its good days and it has its bad days. I think, you know, it's also a question of, you know, I think you also have to just to really frame what we mean by art because you know the general culture, you know, will describe, you know, pop culture to them that's art, you know, and so like. You know, how is art that is like raking in millions of dollars from the American people doing? It's doing abysmal, you know, in terms of really addressing the issues that are plaguing people. In terms of individual artists and activists, I think that, you know, just like it's a reflection of the American public, I think people are waking up. And I think, you know, we are at a we're at an interesting time where never has it been more like okay or safer to to state that you understand that in some ways you can oppress someone else, you know? Um, and so I think that is an, an important step to, to in order to have the conversation to like what to do next. So, I mean, I don't know, but I mean with, and who knows with arts, funding its cuts, you know, that's so dangerous. So, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, artists are some of the most exploited people in our country. I mean, I know for me as a playwright and performer, like, 
you would have to pay to be part of a theater company and cocktail waitress. Like, you had to do something to support your art. Like, I never even dreamed I could ever be paid as an artist. And it was true, most of my friends, it doesn't matter how great your art is, no one's investing in that. Um, and I would say also, like, it's a bad climate now. Like, the National Endowment of the Arts, it's, it's threatened to be closed. Like, we just got, we applied for a grant. They covered our entire main stage show last year about rape culture. You think this administration is going to cover that show again? But it's not even that show. Like, we literally got a note back saying, we're not making any decisions now. Like, do you know how many artists are supported by the NEA? Uh, so, yeah, so I, I think it's, I'm an optimist, so, you know, I, I do look at the statistics that it is risky business being an artist, but I do think art has the power to transform the world, and that's why we're all here. Um, but I do think the landscape is, is particularly threatening right now, um, more, than, more than ever. I, I think we have to emphasize the difference between a culture and politics and give more importance to culture, which is very weak at this moment, because uh, politics is taking everything. It's a dictatorship of politics, and there's no culture now. There's no answer from culture that is strong. So uh, when I think of our gender and social justice, in what way are they related? And I'm thinking philosophically. Uh, I think our gender and social justice want to achieve transformation, metamorphosis, the three of them. But the realm of art and the realm of gender have nothing to do with good and evil. These two realms hate to be defined through a judgment of righteousness. I think art is based on inequality, the inequality of talent. And it's also based on the inequality of feeling. Social justice is based on inequality too the inequality of those that have too much and those that have too little, too little to lose. So that's an answer for me. So in this kind of context, how much more important do you think and what kinds of, um, in face of the challenges, what comes up to you as perhaps opportunities or the, what you must do? I think I must continue writing and I find in, in my extreme passivity my extreme activity because I think it's important to find the usefulness of the useless and the uselessness of the useful. That's what I think. So my, my answer is that I should be like Emily Dickinson or like Walt Whitman who never served anything. They were inept in the practical world, and they, they had visions of how the world should be transformed. So that's my, my answer in a way, you know, but I, I do believe in, in activism in a way. I think there was a moment when Neruda existed, when Picasso existed, that there, there was a strong answer from culture to politics. I don't see that happening now. I saw it in the 70s with, with John Lennon and Yoko Ono when they were in bed making love and they answered, that was an answer to the war in Vietnam from a white man, an oriental woman making love, say make love not war, you know, that's an answer to politics. That's the kind of answer I want from the culture to politics right now, that type of answer. I don't see it. I don't see it at the same level. I see it, culture is here and politics is here. You know, I think that's wrong. I, I want to talk a little bit about joy because I, I know as an artist, like, I get such joy out of creating art and writing. And I stopped writing when I started producing the work of the young people that I work with and I became a producer. And I actually saw a therapist like a couple of months ago and she's like, wow, like you are really missing joy. Like she gave me assignments. She's like, you have to start writing again. Like you haven't written a play for five years. And the truth is like, how can you be part of a movement and help lead a movement without joy, without hope? Exactly. Like it's, it's such a critical part. And there's this wonderful book called, called The Artist's Way. And it basically assigns you to like get up in the morning and the minute you get up, just put that pen to paper 
it assigns you to like go on an artist date, like take yourself to a museum or take yourself to a show. And I know sometimes when we do social justice work and we're activists, we get quite serious. We get quite angry. We get kind of really entrenched in the problem. We want to dig a rut and then furnish it. But we have to, at least for me, like to be the best activist and the best the best activist that I can be, I also have to nurture my art. It gives me legit legitimacy in, in my theater community, in my artist community. So, you know, I put it on the shelf thinking I was doing the right thing by focusing all on the activism and on other people. Um, but John Irving, I don't remember what book it's in, but he, he calls something called the greed of giving. Like, is it re are you really giving? Like, you, got, you can't give something away that you don't have. So filling the well as an artist, I think, is, is just as important as going out in the streets and the activism. Hafiza, what moves you? Jessica's telling us what moves her. I mean, I think as a poet, poetry moves me. And I think to be a poet, it truly has to move you because it is perhaps one of the most obscure arts that you know we're working with in our contemporary culture. But I mean, I think also, I mean, I'm moved when I see spaces where there's equitable distributions of power. You know, so, which means I'm not often moved, you know? <laughs> um, but I, but I try to, but I, I think like, what also moves me, I think is organizations like Girls Be Heard or like Girls Right Now. I, I think investing in young people right now is so crucial. And as a culture, we're not really doing it. I mean, imagine if as a culture that the, the people who believed in, you know, the extra, equitable distribution of wealth invested in young people with the same fervor that the alt-right invests in their young people, you know, because that's what we're up against, you know, these people aren't just passively being like letting these kids watch TV or listen to whatever music, like they, even though they're in, putting in the crazy things in their mind, they are investing in these, in these youth. And so often I hear people be like, oh, we'll just wait for people to die out. No one's going to die out. None of these thoughts are going to die out because we're planting them, you know, they're being sown in the next generation. And I think, you know, the best example of the importance of investing not just in youth, but especially young girls, is the fact that during this last election cycle, I mean, so much of the good and thoughtful reporting came, has been coming from Teen Vogue. You know, who saw that coming? I mean... There have literally been times where I'd be texting with my friends about something that, you know, 45 is doing, and we've been like, well, let's just go see what Teen Vogue is saying, you know? And like, because like, that's like, that's the resource, you know? And so I think, you know, trusting, you know, young people with their own agency. What would you say, what, as, as women activists, what would you say it would be helpful to augment be the, to increase, to facilitate, to bring to a point where your own sense of your activism begins to create tipping points, begins to create changes, you know, for you comes back and grows. You know, what do you think in a moment like this are helpful things or things that you think about, that you dream about? Only if I could, only if this, filling that blank. I think only if the government would get out of my body, I'd have so much more time. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing. Um, but I mean, I also think that like the tipping point, I think like, you know, safe spaces for women where, you know, women can tell their stories, where they can tell their stories and be believed are important. And I think, you know, the fact that we do have, you know, in literature especially, there are more women getting to tell different types of stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, that like, we get to start moving forward once we have an abundance of stories. Like once, like, once people started like, demystifying um, queerness, you know, it became more acceptable in the culture to like decriminalize it. I just work with the people in the streets. I wake up and I go around, I say hello to people, I talk to them, 
I, I always recognize them, they always recognize me. I try to change the mood of the people in the streets. I, I dress for them, I, I, I live for them, and they live for me. So that's how I relate to, to the world, living for, for the people, and finding myself as a medium of them, finding in them their voices and using it, not using it, but transmitting it in my poetry. That's how I, I relate to people. And I see many, many terrible things. I see in shops, I enter, I go to a lot of shops, I enter, I talk to people, and they, they, there are people with PhDs working in shops all the time because they don't find jobs in the streets, you know. These are very, very, and uh, they're waiting. And these people are waiting. I'm waiting too. We're all waiting for a big, big change because the sleeping giant is waking up. But we're, we're waking up. We're still not awoken, totally. Um, I, think, I think I'm very similar um, to you in that, like, I do, there's this um, Jewish mystical saying that everything is sparked with holiness. Yeah. So if you do approach life where you're looking for that, that spark and that holiness, like, I do believe that that's, that's the beginning of change, is being woke, like being awake. Um, I think the biggest obstacle is people who are completely in denial and, and delusional about the problem, and I think you spoke of it so well. I mean, you know, being surrounded by, you know, being a person who has privilege, and then being around people with privilege trying to convince them that they have privilege is like, it's so hard. Thanksgiving dinner can be really hard. But it's not nearly as hard as someone who has to walk around with microaggressions all day long. It's not like getting pinched once, it's like getting pinched all day long. You know, so, yeah, so I'm, I can feel very frustrated and hopelessness about racism in our country, and very frustrated about it, but I'm also very hopeful, and I do try to have these discussions all day, every day, with everyone I can, and I try to bring a spirit of curiosity versus criticism, because I do think that's how we move the needle on things. Um, we, our tagline is staging revolution, so I am a revolutionary, uh, but I try to have the revolution fueled by courtesy, kindness, justice, and love. Like, I really think that I'm going to change the mind. Like, honestly, if I could have a meeting with Trump tomorrow, I would take that meeting. Like, I would try to change that mind. Like, if I could change that mind any little bit, I, we could save lives. Yeah. So many lives. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you reacted to that. I like it very much. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I like in about five minutes, we're going to open up for questions, and I wanted you to know that there are mics on both sides of the room. So, um, before we open up, we often, you know, when we think about culture, social justice, voice, words, when you talked about the need for different stories, different voices, more of an inclusive reality. There have been some efforts, insufficient efforts, certainly at the New York Times Foundation would say very insufficient efforts, but necessary efforts, to um, center the voices of women, the lives of women, and within that, the voices of women who have traditionally been underinvested, unseen, um, and, the, and in that way muted, right, from the, the overall dominant cultures. So, um, what would you say could be things that, not so much government, but other cultural workers, other, in our case, in philanthropy, we're always interested, what we can do better and more, what would you say could be steps forward in this context that we are? And I want to say, summary of the context. Um, I'm going to say traditional funding and support, not to be counted on. Just to just describe that. But also, I think uh, from a, from a view of of the idea of the freedom of thinking, the freedom of expression, the value, the reliability um, of words, the idea that on the one hand, cultural workers 
are devalued, silenced, and further marginalized, and on the other hand, facts don't matter. So when you think about this, what could be, I want us to hear anything comes to you on a daily basis, when you are really thinking about, when you go out and talk to the people, what else, when you find out from those lives that then you know, transmute you, right, and come out also in your heart? When you find yourselves in these places of equality, inequality, right? So what else, what else is, do you think in this moment the rest of folk would meet you at? be as philanthropists, be as partners, be, be as cultural workers. A question, the reason I ask this question is that I guarantee you, most of us, everywhere I go, myself every day, I ask, what can I do in the face of, uh, you know, the enormous rifts that we finally confront? They've always been there, but they are finally very denuded. Um, in the face of um, a surprising sense of um, being the defensive as opposed to being uh, progressively moving towards, I mean, dismantling systems of um, inequality and oppressions. In the face of all of this, what are things that for you, in addition to what you already shared about joy, about inspiration, about, you know, your connectedness to human beings, what else could we consider in terms of going forward? I think we expect too little of people. We only expect money from work, money, we exploit them, we give them so little food for this, their thoughts that they never feel good. And that goes back to the joy. But it is, we, we expect so little of their higher standard of expectation. We only expect a higher standard of living. We're dying. In this culture, our spirit is dying. Without spirit, there's no matter. You know, I think this is the problem. Money is not the solution. Money is not the solution. Our wealth, our interior wealth is dying because culture is dying. So that's what I say. <laughs> How do we cultivate that? How, what is the antidote to that? We, we never expect anything of people. We don't give them any expectations in schools. We don't take the best out of the, the youth. We don't canalize their strength in the, the right way. We don't find their power in themselves. We don't look at their talents. We don't care for their talents. We make them work in labors that they don't care about. That's why we have criminality, so much criminality. Why? because we haven't found the goodness in those people. We haven't found what they're good at, what, what, what stimulates them to get higher in a better way. And that's a lack of education, but it's not education to go to school, because education has become market. Education has, has become a company, and the, the students have become employees of that company. It's not that, it's culture, it's humanism. We have forgotten that. That's what I say. I think it's also important, you know, I think politics does play a really important role in this. I think that it's important to give people the tools in order to live a dignified life. I mean, it's hard to, you know, because I completely understand that, you know, it is hard to care about racism when you know, you're worried about feeding your child, you know? It's hard to want to dismantle that system or see your own privilege in terms of that when you're just really trying to survive. Um, so I think it's a question of, you know, giving people resources. Like, I don't know if anyone's seen The Place Swept by Lynn Nottage. It's amazing, right? Oh my God. It's so good, but it really does talk about like how, you know, at the end of the day, so much of our prejudice is tied around access yes. and economics. And everyone in that play, like, you know, the white people, the black people, everyone gets along until people stop, like, start losing jobs. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you know, the entire framework of this community that they have just kind of disintegrates in their relationships. And so I think that, you know, like, access to dignity 
really changes can change the course of history. It's, it's interesting you mentioned Lynn Nottage because one of the first pieces one of our young women wrote was a play. Uh, there's a piece called What About Lynn Nottage? And it was about standing online. It was just after her first play, Ruin, was written about the rape epidemic in Congo. And it was her and listening to someone online being like, I love Neil Yaboot. He really understands women. And she's just like, oh. And then goes on and on about all the playwrights, male playwrights that write about women and how well they understand women. And she's like just dying online. And she goes, well, what about Lynn Nottage? And they're like, Lynn who? Like, Lynn Nottage, like, she understands women. And it was just this argument of someone that clearly had no idea about female playwrights or female artists, which I think has been the long history, right, of artists, and especially female artists and women of color, and people of color just not being amplified in any way, and not being credited, not being paid. So I hear you about people's humanity, and money is not the answer, but Lord, it hurts when you're, you're writing amazing things and not getting the same access to be heard and payment as, as other people. So, um, yeah, yeah. But, but to, to get back to your point in terms of, <clears throat> you know, I, I can't stop thinking about storytelling because that's what I've always used um, to, one, for my own self-healing, like sharing story. I, I happen to be like 23 years sober this month, so like storytelling saved my life by learning, oh my God, you use alcohol in that way too? Me too. It ruined your life, it ruined mine too. Like so, you, you, you know, the 12-step program is a, is a storytelling program, right? You share your story, and instead of like wanting to die of embarrassment and shame after, people are laughing and like identifying, and so, you know, storytelling is so healing. It, it breaks our isolation, and like you said, taps into our humanity, you know? And I think it's the loneliness and lack of humanity that's really killing us, and, and creating this lack of culture that, you, that you've spoken about. Um, but I also want to talk about storytelling too, because when Girl Be Heard first started, I was real open with my story and what's happened to me growing up and, you know, the, the trials, and I, and I shared it with Girl Be Heard members because it helped them feel safe. And whether they want to share their story at not knowing they weren't alone, it helped them feel safe. But we learned over time that sometimes taking, telling your story is very healing, and sometimes it's re-traumatizing. So having a trauma lens as artists is like so incredibly important. Like one of the things we say at Girl Be Heard, if we're doing a story about, you know, campus sexual assault, the show doesn't have to go on. If we have 10 pieces and two of the participants are not comfortable telling their story that day, we just say take your spiritual temperature. Is it healing or not? You know, so the, sh so the show's gonna be shorter, it doesn't matter. So you really have to take your spiritual temperature as an artist about when it's really healing to express yourself, especially on a stage like this and when it's going to be traumatizing. I know for me and for the artists we work with, it's a, it's a daily reprieve. Like, you have to figure out every day what's going to be healing for you. Um, and I'm happy to say that I, I started writing again this month, and I actually wrote my story, got published this week, um, about kind of early recovery. And yeah, so I'm really so happy to be writing. I feel like I'm different, I feel like I'm like 15 years younger again. Like, I'm just free. Um, but it's really tricky also to tell your story is, if you tell the truth, it, it's going to hurt people. So like, when do, you, when do you tell your story? When do you tell it in a fiction way because, in a, you know, it's because the non-fiction is going to hurt people. So I think as artists, these are really difficult decisions to make in terms of truth telling and storytelling. And having a trauma lens, I think, is the most important thing, both for yourself, your own health and mental health and, and well-being, but also for, for at least a girl we heard, those we serve. When you tell your story, you control the narrative, which is super important, right? And it just connected me back to surveillance which is exactly the opposite of it, yes. right? Yes. It's, so I wanted to connect those two As points. long as you don't have a voice over narration, that's fine. <laughs> that would be like drunk. <laughs> okay, questions. We are at that time of our time. Writing process as uh, a feminist, as a 65-year-old who has to, like every day, I push back against the idea of, oh, I'm never going to be published. Oh, why did I spend $225 on that memoir class? <laughs> when, um, so I guess, and I use the Julia Cameron series. Uh, I started with The Artist's Way on like three books into the series now, like what are your favorite 
resources for women writers? I'd love to take this one. So, I didn't do the artist way once. I did it with a group of women that we could hold ourselves accountable for writing. And I started doing it because I hated my voice. I thought I couldn't sing. I thought I was tone deaf. I thought I was, like, I had all these voices in my head that were telling me I was worthless. But the book is like, do it anyway. Right. And don't do it for somebody else. Do it because it brings you joy. And I think that's the most important thing in terms of creating art is to focus on, you know, what's gonna happen with your art is really dangerous. Like, to do it for yourself because you are an artist was the most important thing for me. It so happened that, like, because I had this bunch, this, these other women, we'd support each other. And honestly, like, at Girl Be Heard, we always say, we will love you until you can love yourself. And having, for me, a community. I know there are some writers that can get up in the morning and just do it all on their own. And, and I, I need a group. Like, I need a community. Yeah, I mean, I've noticed that when I, you know, like, when I was in, the last memoir class I was in that I just finished, like I'm much more productive when I get the, the feedback. And that it isn't enough for someone to just say, oh, here's what I like about it. There, there has to be a support, a, a voice that knows how to be supportive and to still say, here's where you can improve. And that balance is very tricky. So, I guess I'm gonna keep looking for more on this writing group. Yes, don't give up. Write for your own self, right? Is what I heard. Not for what's going to happen with it. Are there other questions? I was wondering yes. if I could pose a question about how you get your ideas before, um, kind of like, potentially, like, if the audience is or even in hostile territory. Because obviously, you know, I love hearing about your work and seeing it done, and it, it benefits the, the, some of these serve communities where there is you know, an immediate impact um, from person to person, but how do you then start to you know, put it to service for social change? So how do you put your work to service for social change? I mean, I will say the interesting thing about being a poet is because there isn't a market for it is that you rely on community in a way that like you've never experienced before because your market like art is other poets you know and so in that way you band together you know around issues like you're saying that like you know this idea of community like a good community will make you uncom so uncomfortable that you want to quit but refuse to let you um, and I think for me personally I mean I know that like I you know, I've worked really hard. I've gotten access to a lot of spaces that, you know, a lot of people who might look like me don't have access to. And so, I mean, the most important thing is, first of all, you need to get yourself to a place where you can reach back. But the important thing is to reach back. Um, and so, you know, I work with Vita and we fight for gender parity, you know. Like, you know, we're really of the, of the mindset that, you know, I think, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who invent, who like came up with the term intersectionality, says that you can't you can't solve a problem that you can't name, um, and so even you know, and that is what art can do that maybe nothing else can do as well is it can name a problem on so many levels because like you know a painting can like not just to fit, depict, for example, like the physical affliction of homelessness, but it can also depict in it the spiritual affliction of it. You know, um, and so I think that is, you know, I think art should be, like, with your art, like, I don't, I'm not of the mindset that you should try to be obscure. I think at the end of the day, like, we're trying to say something, you know, um, something that people can relate to, that they can connect to, and I guess with my art, you know, I'm trying to say as much as I can about, like, the smallest emotion, you know, because there are there's so many, one emotion has so many levels, you know? And I think in our society, we, you know, we, we pigeonhole emotions. Um, so I think just using, using your art to be like a record of truth is really important and working with other people. I can talk a little bit about this as a producer because you're not gonna do the same show for every single audience. Um, you know, something that you do in the East Village as an open mic, you know, you can drop the F-bomb right and left. But if you're going to a school, you know, you want to show respect for the, the faculty there and you want to be invited back. 
I mean, for me, the thing is like, I want to leave the audience wanting more, no matter what show that we do. It doesn't mean I want them to feel uncomfortable. You know, that's one of the beautiful things about art. It brings up so much in us, but, you know, and not every artist agrees in doing every show, right? So we have our artists that are like, I want to do whatever the heck I want. It's like, great, we'll do it with these open mics. But if I bring you to the United Nations, no F-bombs, you know? And also, if I'm going to bring you to, like, it's interesting, because we, we really struggle about corporate. They're like, oh, Chase wants us to do a show for them. Redlining and funding the pipeline, and like, oh, do we do it, don't we do it? You know, but when we ask our constituents, a lot of them are like, yeah, we want to speak to them. They're, they're making these policies impacting our communities. I'm like, you realize we have to do a show that's not going to alienate that audience, but engage them to start talking. And so it's a negotiation when we do a script like that, right? We, we, one, we say no one has to be in it, but if you are part of the cast, let's figure out a way to engage and not alienate that audience, so that the next time they think about redlining, they'll be like, that person who has power to prevent something like that happening in a community, what a huge change that's going to be. So, and not everyone, you know, people can say I'm a sellout, and some people do, that I, that I will not do the same show with every audience. How do you deal with that, Janina? Are you worried at all about acceptance? I want, I or? want to take up on the mystery of things without being God's spy. Without being a spy, I want to take upon the mystery of things without spying on them. And that's the hardest thing to do because sometimes I'm walking, I'm walking in the streets and I see something happens and that is so beautiful and I'm not spying on it. And that's poetry. When that thing happens, that's poetry. <laughs> How do I explain it? I can't explain it. But it doesn't happen in the cameras. <laughs> It doesn't happen in surveillance. And that's the magic and the miracle of life. When you write this, um, do you have a concern about the audience, how the audience is going to receive it, how you're going to position your to a different audience or not? I how write for work? all and for none. That's my answer. So all and for none. Okay, so I don't have an audience in specific because that would be a crazy. I, know, I agree. I, I, agree. Yeah. I totally agree. And I, I want to talk about something important that you all know, which is killing your darlings. Yeah. So one great thing about being in a writing group is I'm not looking for approval for anything. I'm not looking for applause. But like sometimes I think a play is so good. Like there's this one act that I just work so hard on. I think it's so good. And people are like, eh, it's okay. And then another one that I like write in like 30 minutes and it gets published and people are like, that was the greatest thing ever. So our, our own judgment of our own art is so bad. I always tell the people, you know, the young people that we work with, like, please don't throw it away. I don't care if you wrote it on a cocktail napkin, on your toilet paper, just bring it all in. Let us, let us see it all. Because we're the worst judgment of our own art. Yeah. Because the critic is not the artist. And sometimes we, we, we censor ourselves too much. Sometimes we take ourselves too damn serious. Like, I know for me, like, I didn't realize I was a comedic writer until I wrote this one woman's show and then I started these plays. Like, I was so serious before, but I found some, a, a part of myself that I didn't know existed when I started writing and, and just letting myself write freely. We have another question. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you all. I loved the discussion, it was wonderful. I wanted to ask the, the writer who talked about uh, culture being weak and culture not having an answer. Uh, do you think culture is weak or has it been bought out by capitalism? And if so, how can culture reinvent itself? It hasn't been. If, if it has been, how can it reinvent itself? Well, that I don't know because capitalism, like you say, it hasn't been nourished like capitalism, you say? Did you say that? Uh, no, but that sounds good too. I said, do you, <laughs> I said, do you think if culture is weak, has it been bought out by capitalism? And if so, how can we reinvent Beautiful. culture? Capitalism kills culture because it gives money. When money is involved, it kills a lot of things. You know what it kills? It kills the generosity of, of ourselves. Inspiration is a gift. Life is a gift. We're giving. Giving has nothing to do with fundraising. This is something I want to explain to people. Giving has, is like breathing. 
It's, it's like finding the, thing, the things in the street that I'm telling you. The, the discoveries I make in the street when no one is watching. And that's when I write, when no one is watching. And that's generosity. Generosity is not expecting anything and giving. You know, that's what I think. And that's what has to be, and that's culture. That's culture. That's culture. Culture is going to a restaurant and they give you something free. You know, like in Greece. I go to Greece and they give me cookies free. They give me, yes, they give me orange juice free. They give me a little cake free. Why? Why do they do it? Because they love people. That's what we have to to And I go to restaurants here and they say, you sit here. You sit here. You have to... Did, did, you, did you make a reservation? Why should I make a reservation? You know what I mean? That's taking away the fluidity of things. That doesn't let life flow the way life should be flowing. <laughs> I, I am, and that's surveillance. I mean, make a reservation is surveillance. <laughs> Any other comments <laughs> to, to that question? <laughs> no. okay. Hi, um, this is a question for the um, co-founder of Don't Be Heard. Um, so, oh. <clears throat> when surrounded by so many social issues, how does one know when it's time to shift from one topic to another in their craft? I love this question. So, we really let youth run the show, and what's really interesting is literally the first if you start Girl Be Heard at the beginning of the year, it's a 36-week program with Feminist Church every Sunday. But the first session, you literally sit down on the floor and be like, what issues do you care about? And we do the same exact thing with our main stage show, which is the show that we focus on one subject. What issues do you want to write about this year? And what's really interesting, if you let young people make those decisions, they're always ahead of the curve. Like in terms of Newtown writing about gun violence and, and connecting it to racism in our country, like. That wasn't being talked about. People were talking about Newtown and the white guy in the school, but they weren't talking about how gang and gun violence is directly related to, to slavery and racism and you know, poverty and all the things in our country. So, you know, I think it's, it's all about listening. And I think that's what you're saying, really, in terms of life. Like, we're so busy talking at people. Yeah. Like, we literally don't even <sighs> breathe. Understand. Yeah, I know. So understand is to stand under. Stand. That's what we never do. We yes. never stand on there. We all want to be bosses. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I say understand is to stand under the understanding of another person. And here we only want to boss people around. We only want to be bosses, authority. And it, how many bosses are we going to have? The whole nation is going to be a boss. And who's going to obey? Who's going to understand? Only me. I'm the only one. Understand. I, I want to address your question as well um, and just talk about this listening model, right? If you really want to understand. We literally don't breathe. Like, half the time a girl be heard, or even in my own life, like, meditation is so important in my life. Like, I'm like a gerbil on the gerbil wheel with like five million thoughts before seven o'clock in the morning. Like, just like breathing. Like, just breathing. Even not even, just being present with someone. Like, when you're not even talking, like, that's when the magic can happen. And if you believe in a spirit bigger than yourself, like, that's when the spirit comes in. So, listening to young people is so critical to discovering what the next show is going to be. I, I realized we had some survivors of, of trafficking in, in our company. And we had one survivor that was trafficked at age nine from a janitor in Queens, in Jamaica, and was kidnapped every day from three to five, um, which they could do because this young person was living in a shelter, so you know, no one was going to notice. Sold in a car, returned back to school at five, and took the bus home to the shelter, day after day after day. And in our country, we were talking about sex trafficking in Thailand and Cambodia and other lands. Nobody was talking about what was happening in New York City. So again, by listening, that became an important show that we did before people were talking about sex trafficking here in our country. You know, and I think, you know, rape culture again. They, our young people decided they wanted to do a show about rape culture 
before the pussy grabbing even was mentioned. Like for some reason their hand was on the pulse of the issue before it surfaced. So I think that trust and faith in young people and really listening to young people is key to driving a movement that has power and integrity and legitimacy. And, and the same thing with the art and the shows, because you want to have all those things in your art as well. Thank you. We have time for one, more, one or two questions. Anybody else? Yes, you have your hand up there. Uh, Jessica, can you talk about how you engage people without alienating them? Because so much of social justice framing is certainly defining the problem, but then they just reiterate the problem rather than the vision and the future they want to see. So can you give us a concrete example of how you engage without alienating groups? Sure. Um, I piss a lot of people off, um, especially young people who a lot of times, you know, I, I think social media is a very powerful tool, but it's also kind of taught the next generation. I have 14-year-old boys that, like, you can communicate with sound bites. Like, trying to have a two-way conversation with my sons is, like, almost impossible. You know, like, they've been taught to communicate in sound bites. Um, so, yeah, so good thing for me is in Girl Be Heard, we have, like, three rich, beautiful hours together on Sundays and in our after-school programs where we get to have these longer conversations. Um, but I, also, I, I don't believe that you write something and then put it on stage. Like, I'm a huge proponent of the editing process and workshopping work. And I think, again, with an open mic, you can write what you want and put it out there. But it does take time to figure out how to get a message across to reach deep into someone's heart and humanity so that you can change them. Because we want to excite and engage and inspire the converted the people that already understand about misogyny and patriarchy and how important it is to smash it. But if we're going to move the needle, like how do we reach that CEO of Chase so that he can treat his workers better and stop getting sued by women for underpaying them and stop redlining? Like how, how do we reach that person? So we try to have those discussions in the development of a work, of, of wor a working script to ask those questions. Which piece do you think is going to change that person's mind? And let's put those pieces forward. Okay, last question. Can I, add, can I add one more thing to that? So I also think that a very diverse cast is a very powerful and dangerous cast. So I know with The Chase Show, we serve a lot of girls of color, but anyone can audition for the theater company. And particularly this year in addressing racism, there is one young woman, Katie, who kind of had an anti-racist lens, but after 36 weeks, it got so deep that she wrote these pieces about white privilege that once people heard this, these, these pieces, they're like, everyone's asking for Katie and the rest of the cast as well, but they're like, you don't understand, like the white men in our school or the white men in our corporation, like they need to hear from white Katie about white privilege and what it's like to have lived with it her entire life and how much pain she and her community has caused so many other people. So I think that diversity of cast too, as all different voices, is really important. And it also can be very exploitive, right? If you're only putting forth voices that have been oppressed. Um, I think it's important to have put, voice, put forth voices who have been privileged and to share about that privilege and the pain and suffering that's caused other people. Okay. Um, yes. So I caught the, la the um, end of the last panel. Um, I, I forget what it was about, but they, what is, I mean, come on, I was like the last seven minutes. But um, one of the an audience mem members asking about philanthropy, and um, leader of a nonprofit said, "Before you donate money, you need to ask what an organization needs." So since you're here, I'm wondering if people want to get involved, like what is it that you need? Money, time, volunteers? <laughs> action steps. Action steps for people. I, I have to say. Everyone needs an Anna, so I just want to really give a round of applause for this woman who has helped so many organizations. No, no, seriously. We started in 2009 at my kitchen table with nothing, doing street theater. I didn't go on payroll till July 1st, 2013, when New York Women's Foundation gave us a grant. Literally. Like, I'm going to cry just thinking about it. Like, it was the middle of the recession. We were too radical for everyone. Like, it was so hard. I had two other jobs just to continue Girl Be Heard. You know, and it was, that was like the turning point to have one person actually have faith in what you're doing was transformative and we would not have existed if it wasn't for New York Women's Foundation, Anna. So I, I have no way to thank you enough.
So let me just clarify that the foundation is a group of incredible people, not me, <laughs> just a little part of it. Thank you, but uh, some of whom are here in the audience um, with you. And the reason why this is so important to us, and I appreciate your question, because not so much because you're talking about the foundation, but because you're talking about what we believe is the best way to do philanthropy, which is that those the problems and solutions are, are living together in the same place. And those who are closest to problems are closest to solutions. And the, the, you were talking about understanding, right? In the sense of putting the other one first and standing down to the voice, the needs, the perspective, the solutions, right? What people need, and you just did that. Right, Hafiza, you asked Jessica. So the foundation, what this conversation is so important is because to put your voices first, you know, first of all. That is the kind of philanthropy we do. But in a conversation earlier, there was a little bit of a discussion about, you know, um, the importance of the, the dignity of the material life of all of us, right, and communities. And uh, the idea that uh, there are fundamental human needs they ought not, not be there. They should be there, just as a given. Food, shelter, financial resources, health, etc. As well, I would say, the ability to, to be a cultural worker, right? a creative person, have a voice, right? So um, in philanthropy, we always, for us, is important, is very important to be able to fund, because when you fund and you follow people, we follow you. This is what happens. But also that is important to influence, and that's why the, today is so important for us, because of the realm of ideas, the realm of culture, the, what happens. It's so important to change the world. So, um, and that's why we think that the work of Penn and you being here, and you being cultural workers as well, is so important. Um, now, we, for us, the whole, and that was my earlier kind of wanting to probe into your brains about the inequalities that exist, even in progressive circles, about um, access to resources, to visibility. When I say resources, it's not just money, but money, visibility. So we're really pleased that you're here this evening and did this. And I'm going to ask you for your final comments before we close. Well, I love being here and talking to all of you and trying to understand what I don't understand, which is social justice. I don't understand only a little bit. And I don't understand about fundraising, but I understand myself, and I understand what generosity means, and I think that's what I understand. Thank you. <laughs> say my last thing would be in terms of social justice for specifically speaking to women I think one of the most important things you can do is also to make sure you find your joy because joy is a radical act and it's hard to access and find and make space for you know during these crazy times. And I didn't answer your question before, is that we've had a little bit of a white flight at Girl Be Heard because I required um, people in our community to take anti-racist training, a two and a half day training. And so I have, a, honestly, what I need more than anything is that I don't have hardly any corporate support. I have a gala coming up October 3rd and like, we're kind of radical, you know? So I'm looking for board members that might have access to financial support um, to come and join us as long as they're willing like if they don't have an anti-racist lens if they're willing to like have an anti-racist lens and and honestly I, I lose hair and I, I get gray and I lose sleep at night like worrying about how I'm gonna pay all the young people that I've employed and this is like the missing link at Girl Be Heard is finding that leadership who has the mindset that we're talking about today um, that's my dream so thanks that's what we need <laughs> so please join in thanking them for a fabulous thank you